Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, my name is Anna Rue, and I'd like to greet you all and give you season's greetings today in December. Um, I am a folklorist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I serve as the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures. I'm really excited to be co-hosting today's presentation with my friend and fellow folklorist, Nathan Gibson. And today's presentation will feature Carl Rockinen speaking about Finnish American dance music through the ages. For all of those um, who are joining us for the first time as part of this year long series and virtual FinFest in 2021, welcome. I would like to open by thanking you all for being here and thanking FinFest for organizing this really wonderful series of events. Today is the final event in the series for the year, and we've been really proud to work together with our FinFest colleagues to bring you a really enjoyable and interesting set of talks and performances throughout 2021. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures here at UW-Madison and the Sustaining Scandinavian Folk Arts in the Upper Midwest Project, of which I'm also a part. We're also called Nordic Folk Life, if you recognize us under that name. We are very excited to have, it looks like we're up to 97 people here this morning um, supporting Finnish um, American music and FinFest, and we're really excited to see um, all of you here again. Uh, we'll be making some links available for you all throughout the, the program, and we will follow up with more links and resources after the program. Um, and you can look out for those for those uh, further readings and links through the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures. This is a live program held on the Zoom webinar uh, format, and that means that the presenters can't see or hear the audience, and the audience members cannot see or hear each other. We will have time for questions at the end, so uh, please use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Um, please feel free to continue sharing in the chat as well. And we will monitor those questions and, um, and ask those of the presenter um, towards the end of the program today. And we're also recording this session and we'll be sharing it out through the FinFest website as well as the YouTube channel for the Center for the Study of Upper Midwestern Cultures at a later date. So um, as we welcome everyone to the FinFest webinar series, this final event in our series, I would like to take one final moment to talk about place and to have you all think about the place that you're in. I work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which lies on Ho-Chunk land. And I mention this to acknowledge where we are and to acknowledge that we can't tell the story of immigration of history and heritage in this country, of family and friends, without also understanding where we came from, where we are, who came before us, and who will come after us. So as we gather here from places across this country and across the globe, we invite you to think for a moment about the people who are in the place you currently live. Think about those who are kin to you and those who aren't. Think about how the land may have changed over time, how it's changing in front of you, and how it will continue to change after we're gone. These connections have helped shape who we are and help shape the places we live in today. So we encourage you to embrace that and reflect on this for just a moment because these ideas of history and heritage, immigration, kinship, and place are part of what we're talking about throughout this series. And we hope that these reflections will help bring a deeper connection and understanding to our conversation today. And now I would like to hand it over, the mic over, so to speak, to Nate to introduce today's presentation and, um, and our esteemed colleague and uh, presenter, Carl Rakinen, and the Finnish American Dance Music Through the Ages. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, most of our, our participants uh, already know Carl, but just in case there's one or two newbies, I'm going to give him an introduction. Uh, Carl is a folklorist, an ethnomusicologist, uh, and a musician. I have heard him referred to as the Bob Dylan of the Cantalet. 
uh, who worked as a music librarian and professor for 34 years at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He is a graduate of Indiana University's Folklore and Ethnomusicology Department and wrote his dissertation on the Kantele tradition in Finland. And when I was going through the same program, there was nobody there at the same time who was interested in Finland. And so I recall uh, Carl being extremely helpful as I was sending out my, uh, my first dissertation proposal and thinking about music in Finland and Carl giving me such wonderful guidance and feedback and helping me at the earliest stages of graduate school. Uh, thank you again, Carl. Uh, just a wonderful, generous scholar uh, who is brilliant and knows a lot about the topic. Uh, he is, was the Na Finlandia National uh, Lecturer of the Year, and he has published extensively in Music in Suntu, Finnish Music Quarterly, uh, Finnish American Reporter, Journal of Finnish Studies, Ethnomusicology, Suomen Anthropology, uh, Journal of American Folklore, and many more. He has a new book that's coming out uh, called The Finnish American Musical Journey. There will be two chapters, as I understand, about Finnish dance music. Uh, you may have recently read about them in the latest Finnish American Reporter, uh, but if you haven't, you'll hear about Finnish dance music today. And if you did read it already, you're going to hear the music today. Uh, Carl's got a whole bunch of great tunes lined up to share with us. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful presentation. So please welcome Dr. Carl Rockinen uh, to FinFest USA. Thank you. Thank you, Nate and Anna, for such a marvelous introduction. Finnish American dance music had its root roots in the dance music of Finland was based on the music and dances that the Finnish immigrants brought with them to America. Some of the earliest transcribed dance music of Finland came from Sweden in the late 18th century and centered around a dance called the Polska. That should not be confused with the polka. The Polska was a dance in three beats that originated in Poland and found its greatest dissemination in Scandinavia. A century later, get my next slide up here. A century later, when the greatest wave of immigrants came, the most popular dance forms were the waltz, the schottisch, frequently called the yenka in Finland, and the polka, a fast dance in two beats that became immensely popular throughout Europe in the second half of the 19th century. In the 20th century, more modern dance forms came to Finland, such as the foxtrot, the humpa, and the tango. Finns used the term yats, which spelled J-A-Z-Z, -Z, to describe these newer forms. Not really American jazz, but, but Finnish yats. I know of only one instance of the Finnish polska coming to America. Frank Hiatala from Alabieska, Finland, immigrated to Minnesota in 1906. He transcribed the Polska tunes that he knew in 1942, and in 1960, folklorist Eli Kungas made field recordings of many of them, tunes which were no longer known in Finland. This music was later published as a tune book in 1998 by the renowned Finnish fiddler Arto Järvila. What we know about the history of Finnish American dance music has come primarily from three sources written music and documents in archival collections, sound recordings, and newspaper accounts. I had a sabbatical in uh, 2017, and I went to four different archives, took more than 8,000 photographs. This is the only photograph I took of the inside of the archive, which is at the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota. The source, these sources give us information about musicians who had enough formal training to read and write music and made commercial recordings and who toured to various Finnish halls. In other words, the well-known musicians. The vast majority of dance music was performed by those who played only for their local audiences. I hope that the musicians I describe here today are representative of the many unrecognized musicians of the Finnish American community. Lionel Davis collection at the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota is the largest known compilation of Finnish American dance music that tells us much about the dance culture of the time. I made several trips to the IHRC over, over a decade, but I never looked at this collection until 2017, and it turned out to be the holy grail of Finnish American dance music. The Davis collection is not physically large. It's one of the reasons I didn't look at it. It's only six inches in one box. 
And, but this contained hundreds of pieces of dance music uh, for a total of 487 pieces that were in there. Each tune was written out on a single page, half the size of a standard sheet of paper. So you can see the image of this uh, Vimen and Vilitus, which means the latest craze polka. Music was written on two staffs and G clef on each, and was a con which was a convention at the time for piano accordion music. Having been reproduced decades ago, some of the pieces were in poor condition and many of the titles and music were hard to read. The transcriber gave uh, only the title of the two, not mentioning any composers or arrangers. The only clue as to who may have compiled this music was a type of signature at the end of many pieces with an extended staff suggesting an arrow shape and a squiggle in between. You can see that on the, on the image at the bottom of this piece of music. The collection contained a letter to Lionel Davis from Oscar Newgard of Red Lodge, Montana, who was an early Finnish American musician. According to Newgard, this music was written out by Anthony Pollock, a music director at several Finn halls in the Eastern states, but most importantly at the Saima Hall in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. He was also the most prolific composer and arranger of Finnish American workers' music found in the Tuemia Society collection at the IHRC. So this music probably dates from about the same time, which is the late 1920s and early 1930s. I looked through a lot of the tunes in here and I made a, a Excel spreadsheet for all the titles and so on. So I can, I can talk about some of the familiar tunes that were found in there. We see, of course, many familiar Finnish tunes like Lili Ru, Su, and Orpopoyan Baltsi. And we see a lot of American tunes as well such as Anniversary Waltz and Boops a Daisy and so on, think about the time. And we see waltzes there from Sweden and from Russia and other places. But then it's also missing some of the uh, most uh, familiar of the waltzes, such as Emma and, and Metzakukia. Now, when I saw a tune that I kind of liked, I uh, played through them on, on my violin and I just picked one that I thought might be representative. This tune is, is called Suomen Balkat Uet. It is, means uh, Finnish White Nights. And um, to be able to do this, I recorded this with my sister, Alisa Rochkonen, who lives in Mount Vernon, Washington. And we recorded this on my uh, mother's dining room table. <laughs> and I used my other sister, my Christina Rochkonen's violin when we played this. So this is Suomen Balkan Uet. And the purpose of playing this for you is just to show you the finishness in it and that there are many tunes that are, are really great. And, and so on. this is a three part tune, G minor, second part is in D flat major, then in G minor. <laughs> If any of you know the origin of that tune, it'd be nice if you uh, wrote to me and, uh, and talked about it, but uh, I haven't been able to find much about it. Same thing with the shottishes. There's lots of familiar shottishes in this, like Mailman Makti, Lenin, Lokari, and so on. And it includes Scandinavian, Russian, Ukrainian, and Roma shottishes. 
And but what's missing, the only one I found maybe missing is valley eye kind. The transcriber used the term sotiisi with one T, it's usually spelled with two T's for the Finnish tunes and the term shottish for the non-Finnish tunes, but they did not use the term yenka at all in there. Now, as representative of the shottishes, I'm going to play this piece called Rutina ja ruske. If you look up what rutina and ruske mean, that means crash. So a crash happened. I don't know if the shottish sounds like something crashing, but it's a very nice uh, shottish. Again, um, this is in G major, the first part, second part is in G major, but then it cadences in E minor, which I think is something that, uh, that gives it a little finishness. <laughs> Okay, now the, there were also lots of polkas in this uh, collection, and there are, again, uh, very familiar polkas, pol Finnish polkas like Lukkari Heikin polka and Itin Tiltu, and, and the novelty song Kerensky, which is uh, a really interesting thing. I'm not going to, unless someone asks me about Kerensky, I'm not going to tell you about that. But at the same time, we have beer barrel polka, clarinet polka, and one called the American polka, and Russian, Hungarian, Italian, and even African American ones. They would say that on it, on the titles. But what's missing there is pro probably the most familiar polka among Finnish Americans, the Karelian polka, or the Karelian boys. Now, uh, the tune I selected to represent the polkas here, polka tunes, is something called. Hilo Hilo, Van Han Mon Polka, or uh, Hilo Hilo, I've seen translated as willy nilly. And Van Han Mon Polka is, means the old country polka. This begins, uh, and this is for my friend Rich Koski, begins very much the first two beats like the Polska, which is Hoivist on Polska. So let's listen to Hilo Hilo Polka, which really is a polka. <laughs> Okay, so what do we learn from looking at the music, these 487 tunes in the Davis collection? They contained many familiar tunes, but some of the best known ones were missing. Someone wants to ask me about that. I, I have some, a good explanation about why they might have been missing. There's a wide range of dance music from Finland, United States, Russia, and other countries, which I think is quite possible that these musicians played lots of other music besides that. There are strong connections with the dance music of Finland at the time, so-called yachts, especially of the famous Dallape Orchestra in, in Helsinki. Very, uh, many of their tunes appear in this collection. 
There were some contemporary tunes such as, as Foxtrot, but there are no tangos. And I think that kind of dates when this collection is, is this collection was transcribed at a time before tango became like almost the national dance of Finland. And another thing is that there's lots of major key dances in this tune. We tend to think of, of Finnish tunes as minor key. And, it, and uh, according to Davis, and he did the analysis on that, 75% are in major keys and only maybe 25% in minor keys. That's the overall tonality. Many of them are two and three parts and they change tonality uh, during that. So I think that gives us some idea. Most of the Davis collection tunes are not known among Finnish Americans or anyone else today, but they may, but they are, there are many excellent tunes in the collection that could still be performed and appreciated today. The earliest Finnish American instrumental music was that of brass bands, which continued the band traditions of the old country. Most local Finnish communities in North America had a soitta punta or a band which provided ceremonial and social music. Initially, these bands also provided dance music as well. But as Paul Niemistö, the foremost authority on these bands, has written, Finnish American, and this is quote, Finnish American bands played for social dances during the first few years before dance orchestras and accordions became more common, end quote. One of the earlier recording artists among Finnish American community was Juho Koskelo, an opera tenor and cellist who toured the United States in the early 20th century and immigrated permanently to the United States in 1910. According to Pekka Grono, between 1910 and 1923, he recorded 150 selections for four different record companies. He was noted for recording the couplet songs of Ye Alfred Tanner, and many of these songs became well-known dance tunes among Finnish Americans, such as Pulkurin Valtsi and Orpopoyan Valtsi. Many of these early recordings used band accompaniment with their singing, and that's, that's the only reason I'm playing this. This is the earliest uh, example that I have here recorded in 1920, before the time of electric recording. So they, he would have to sing into a megaphone, into a horn, and they needed loud instruments to accompany. And besides, at the time, the bands were all the rage before the accordion become, uh, kind of takes over the scene. So let's listen to this early recording of, uh, I think it's Gulkurin Valtsi with Juha Kost. I need to apologize that I'm only playing short excerpts of these, but I do have a handout that I sent through Anna, which has links to the websites for all of these, all of these recordings. And this particular recording is found on the Library of Congress website at the World Jukebox site. And it's such an old recording that's a blue amber all uh, Edison cylinder. So the, the sound quality is not uh, quite as good as the later recordings. All the rest of the examples that I will be playing today are found on YouTube and, uh, and many, many more. And so uh, I'm only playing excerpts or short excerpts to illustrate particular uh, points in, in the presentation. The invention of the accordion changed the world of dance forever. Even the earliest forms of the accordion were portable and allowed a single musician to play both melody and accompaniment and be loud enough to provide adequate music for a dance. A single accordionist could play gigs by themselves, but frequently they teamed up with other instrumentalists, such as a melody, a melody instrument such as violin or trumpet. The ensemble could expand further to include drums or other so-called modern instruments such as saxophone, xylophone, banjo, or guitar. They frequently played with a second accordionist and one playing more the melody and the other more the harmony. 
and this is the most important point, the majority of all Finnish American musicians are piano accordionists. Will, William or Willie Larson was one of the earliest successful Finnish American piano accordionists and dance musicians. Larson was born in 1885 in Kotka, Finland, of parents who originally came from Norway. As a young man, he was a sailor, and by the early 1900s, he had come to live in New York City. Little is known of his early musical training, but it must have included learning how to read and write music and music theory, since Larson was known for writing arrangements of traditional Finnish and Scandinavian tunes. Unfortunately, he passed away relatively young at the age of 49. After his death, Pietro Dero published a collection of his arrangements as Larson's Scandinavian Songs and Dances. This is in 1937, which was later reissued in an expanded edition under the title Larson's Traditional Finnish Songs and Dances, 1943. These accordion albums contained many of the dance tunes which became well known in the Finnish American community even to the present day. Larson recorded 72 pieces in the 1920s and early 1930s on Columbia and Victor labels, which included such familiar tunes as Sak Yerven Polka, the Satchel Lake Polka, and Lukkari Haking Polka, the Kander Hakes Polka, and the Viimeinen Valtsi, or the Last Waltz. On 26 of these 72 recordings, he accompanied celebrated Finnish American singers. Now, these, this shows you some of the pieces that he accompanied and the singers that he accompanied. Uh, I'm going to play for you today the Sakyatavan polka because it is such an important polka among Finnish and fin fin Finns and Finnish Americans. The 1939 version by Viljo Vesterinen with the Dalape Orchestra is kind of the standard, but it's been, it's been uh, played also by the Olu Hotshots on their album, Bringing It Back and uh, was featured in this movie, uh, 1989 movie of the Leningrad Cowboys called Go America. Uh, this is a Aki Kaurismäki movie. And since Professor Nestigan talked about some of his movies in the, in the last uh, MinFest lecture, I thought it would be appropriate to do this. But uh, what's really interesting is to hear the first version of this by, by Vili Larson, and, and here it is. He play, it's a four part polka, and he plays all four parts, but they're somewhat simplified. So let's listen to that. <laughs> Also, uh, failed to mention this fantastic guitar work on that recording. And I have really tried to find out who these guitar players were that are playing on these recordings, but they, they are really good. And uh, I suspect that they were studio musicians who were brought in to, to add, add some rhythm to, to the recordings. John Rosenthal, born 1891, was a central figure in the history of Finnish American dance music. Today, he's remembered mainly as Viola Turpinen's first professional performing partner, but he was a fine musician in his own right, playing violin and banjo, and he was an empresario, someone who organized tours that made them famous among Finnish Americans. We know about John Rosenthal's life and career, 
career since he kept a series of scrapbook diaries. They show that Rosenthal spent a great deal of time and effort in obtaining engagements and organizing their details. Through letters and personal contacts, he developed a network of venues where he and his musicians could perform. He placed advertisements in local newspapers and made posters promote each event and ensure an audience. He also kept careful track of receipts and expenses, proving that in addition to being a musician, he was a hard-driven businessman. Rosenthal probably learned about the entertainment business from vaudeville, which was popular at the time. Rather than playing the vaudeville circuit of theaters, he performed mostly at Finnish halls. As in vaudeville, Rosenthal was far more than just a musician. He was a full-fledged entertainer. His diaries were full of jokes and interesting stories, which he may have collected from other performers or made up himself. Sometimes he translated these into Finnish if a joke would make sense. These jokes were full of puns, satire, and sexual innuendo. To get an idea of what Rosenthal was like, uh, look at the very bottom of the diary uh, cover here on the left side. He types something on there that's pasted in. It, and what he types is, there is so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it doesn't behoove any of us to talk about the rest of us. OK. A typical performance would follow a pattern established in the old country, that of iltama yatansi. In other words, a concert program followed by a dance, which also included jokes and stories. In the summer of 1926, he toured with accordionist Isaac Mikila among the Finnish Falls in northern Minnesota. In August, they toured the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where Rosenthal met his new playing partner, Viola Turpin. Viola Turpinen, born in 1909 in Champion, Michigan, has been the best known Finnish American musician of all time. She had great impact from the late 1920s to the 1950s, both in her many performances at Finn Halls throughout the United States, as well as from her uh, compositions and sound recordings. Rosenthal's diaries show that in their early time together, they were both taking private lessons on their instruments to become even better musicians. Viola Turpinen studied with some of the best piano accordionists of the time, including Leo Fersanti of the Accordion Institute of Chicago and Pietro Deiro, the self-proclaimed father of the accordion in New York. Deiro not only taught Viola, but he also helped her develop into an accordion star. Um, I want to play you one, one recording, an early recording of, of Viola Turpinen's which is called Viola Masurka, it was recorded in 19, on May 10th, uh, I'm sorry, May, November 19th, 1928. What's interesting about this is that although the record says it's Viola Masurka and so on, it, to me, the piece sounds very Italian. And it sounds uh, like, and, and the point I'm making here is that Viola Torpinen is well known because she was a virtuoso player. She was one of the very best accordion players, probably of all time, right up there with uh, Guido and Pietro Dero and the other, other accordionists who were on vaudeville. So let's listen to this recording and see what kind of technique that she has. <laughs> Now that is very clean and articulate playing. And you have to keep in mind that when you went to the studio to record, you got one shot at it. There was no way to edit. There was no way they had to start from scratch if you missed anything. And she doesn't miss a lot on these recordings. She was extremely good. John Rosenthal at the time was taking lessons to learn to play the tenor banjo, an instrument popular in dance bands. The tenor banjo had the timbre, volume, and drive to compete with any other instrument, including the piano accordion. 
In playing both violin and banjo, Rosenthal was able to preserve tradition while at the same time he looked forward to the popular American music of the era. Now I had to look pretty hard to find a recording with John playing banjo. So here's one called the Eloin and Polka recorded May 10th, 1929 with John playing banjo, uh, viola torpin and on accordion. And you can hear what his banjo technique is like on this uh, recording. <laughs> Turpinen and Rosenthal made extensive tours each year from 1928 to 1930, which went through New York City, through New England, around the Great Lakes, and the upper Midwest, particularly the northern areas of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. This is a very important point that I learned from studying these diaries for more than a year now. The majority of their time was spent on the road, sometimes living for months in areas with larger Finnish American populations, such as Detroit, Chicago, Duluth, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They made only one tour to Finland in the summer of 1929, where they followed the same pattern of performing in a new place almost every night, and, where, and they were very well received. After their return from Finland, they again toured to the upper Midwest, where they met and added another accordionist to their group, Sylvia Polso. Sylvia was born in Ironwood, Michigan in 1911, a mining town on the border with Wisconsin. She was a talented piano accordion player, and by the time she was a teenager, began touring the Finhall circuit of the upper Midwest. Posters in her scrapbook show that she played with violinist Charles Ritala, a program of, quote, very latest and popular dance music besides peppy hits for the old timers, end quote. In their advertisements, the trio was called the Viola Torpenin Orchestra or Viola Torpenin Company or just their individual names. Viola was listed first, probably since she had the greatest name recognition. The Viola, Sylvia, and John instrumental trio recorded five pieces for Victor Records on August 3rd, 1931. So let me play you one of the things and you hear a completely different sound in uh, this piece. Uh, this is called Kaikuya Tansi Salista, or Echoes from the Dance Hall. And it's a fine shotish or a yenka. You hear uh, two accordions and violin and it, it's a, it's a pretty powerful sound. Now this piece to me sounds very Scandinavian and record companies many times they would put out if, if Eddie Jarl had a piece and so on they would record it with another group and give a Finnish title to it. And, but I haven't been able to place exactly um, if this is a Scandinavian piece but it sounds very very Scandinavian. <laughs> The trio broke up in November 1931 when Viola left to form her own ensemble. John Rosenthal died from an accidental fall at his home in December of 1932, and Sylvia began playing more American music in New York hotel ballrooms under the stage name Sylvia Reed. She married physician Harold Eidnoff in 1937, and they moved to El Paso, Texas in 1946. 
In 1931, Antti Kosola organized a Rai by a Holly Tansi Orchestra, that's a Pioneer Hall Dance Orchestra, which included from left to right, William Suriela, Viola Torpinen, Antti Kosola, and Sylvia Polson. This group, also known as the Finnish Accordion Quartet, performed at the Fifth Avenue Socialist Hall, sponsored by the FWEA. I spent some time trying to find out what FWEA stood for. It means the Finnish Workers Educational Association. It is not known how long this group performed together, but it certainly represented the best in Finnish American dance music. I'm going to say more about Antti Kosola later. And no, I could not find any recordings of this particular ensemble playing together, or uh, recordings of. William Suriela, or Suralia, he actually used both spellings, was born in 1898 in Vesivat Fehma Asikala near Lahti, Finland. His family immigrated to Cloquet, Minnesota in 1904, where Bill grew up and survived the infamous Cloquet Fire of 1918. He studied music at Valparaiso University in Indiana and was a very versatile musician who played violin, trumpet, and drums. He returned to Cloquet, where he taught music, played in the city band, and reportedly heard Viola Turpinen play for the first time. By the late 1920s, he was a professional musician in New York. Bill Suriela and Viola Turpinen were married on June 6, 1933, at the Fifth Avenue Hall, which was attended by many musicians and friends including Pietro Dero. On June 9th, the full page newspaper congratulations appeared, uh, which was signed by nearly 200 people. They continued to perform as the Viola Turpin and Suriela Orchestra, and except for the war years, they did an annual tour to Finn Halls around the country. From Suriela's archival collections, we discover that they performed a surprisingly wide variety of music, Certainly Finnish and Finnish American tunes, but also classical music, standard American popular tunes, Scandinavian tunes, and other ethnic American tunes. As proof of their popularity, they continued to be asked to make recordings, sound recordings at a time when the ethnic sound recording market was in decline due to the Great Depression and changing tastes. They recorded as a trio with pianist Werner A. Birch, uh, who was born in 1898, an accompanist, organist, choir director, and composer in New York. I read that uh, Birch had a music publishing company that specialized in Finnish accordion music, but I have yet to find a single existing piece of music. Now we're going, I'm going to play you one of uh, Werner Birch's own uh, compositions. This is called Surun Kaiho Ue, or The Yearning Night of Sorrow, which is a waltz. It's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And the piano part in here sounds a lot like xylophone. He improvises up and down, and, and uh, it, it was the style of the time. In October 1952, Viola and Bill moved to Lake Worth, Florida and lived in, quote, the house that Polkas built, end quote. Bill earned a real estate license and he sold homes in the area. They continued to perform music at the Kenta Hall, which means field hall, later called the Kerhotalo or clubhouse, which was the socialist Finn Hall in Lake Worth. They kept in correspondence with fans around the country, for example, by sending out Turpin and Orchestra Christmas cards every year. And uh, this is one my one nod to the holiday here. You can see some Viola Turpin and Christmas cards. There were other groups that toured the Finn Hall circuit. And uh, this one was the famous, the famous Mackie Trio uh, who completed tours uh, at around the same time, late 1920s, early 1930s. 
The trio was made up of siblings, brothers Arvo, born 1907, who played piano accordion, Sulo, born 1905, who played the drums, and later also banjo, and their sister Signe, who was born in 1910, who played the saxophone. They were the children of Herman Behamaki, who was a renowned one and two row accordion player from Yalas Yadervi, Finland, before he immigrated to the United States in 1905. Herman initially worked in an iron mine until he was injured in 1909, after which he purchased a milk farm near Caspian, Michigan, only a few miles from where Viola Turpinen grew up. Herman taught his children the, the traditional music he knew, which they performed, but they also added many contemporary dance pieces. Arvo Mackey played his first dance at the age of nine, and like Turpinen, learned piano accordion from an Italian professor called Favairo. His brother Sulo joined him at the age of 12 and their sister when she was 15. They toured mostly in the upper Midwest playing short concert programs and dances in the same fashion as Viola Torpin. In 1929, they recorded 14 selections for Victor, both in their uh, New York and Chicago studios. Now I had, I had several on my handout, you'll see several examples, but I wanted to play, and they're, they're kind of sad, slow pieces. But I think that this example here, of the, yeah, the Mackie Trio, uh, is really representative of how they sounded. They sounded a lot like any other polka band at the time. And especially with the drums and the and the, the the way the drums are used in the saxophone. So here it is. Uh, this is called Li Na Polka from 1929. Let me try this. Here we go. Andrew Anthe or Andy Kusola uh, was born in Iron Belt, Wisconsin in 1896. From around the mid 1920s to the late 1930s, Kusola lived in New York City, where he played piano and piano accordion and worked as a performer, composer, and arranger, and organized and directed his own ensembles. The Anthe Kusola Orchestra received credit for playing on more than 50 sound recordings for both Columbia and Victor accompanying many of the well-known Finnish and Finnish and American artists. In, on April 10th, 1929 in Copenhagen, Finnish operatic tenor Ture Aura recorded Emma, which became one of the best known Finnish waltzes. On the other side of the recording was Vili Rusu, another very well-known waltz. The lyrics were written by Everett Suonio and the arrangement of the traditional tune for orchestra was done by Hermann Schibru. Six months later, on October 14, 1929, the same two tunes were recorded in New York with Finnish-American singer Leo Kauppi, accompanied by the Antikosola Orchestra. The two recordings show vastly different approaches to the same tune. So let's listen to them back to back. Uh, Dura Ara, who's an opera singer accompanied by full orchestra, and the Emma Waltz, and what I want you to listen to is the music in the bridge. After the first verse of the song, listen to the music in the bridge, and then we'll do the same thing with the American recording. <laughs> Sydän 
Onnesi annoit ja rakkautesi pannoit ja lupasit olla minun omani. Okay, now for the American recording. The music is identical, same key, only the instrumentation was different. You're going to hear accordion, trumpet, and xylophone. Again, listen to the bridge and pay particular attention to the xylophone player who is a master of improvisation. <laughs> Muistatko, en mä sen kuutamo illan kuun yhdessä tanssista kuljettiin. Kun syömmeesi annoit ja valasi vannoit ja lupasi tolla mun omani. Oi emma, oi emma, oi emma, oi emma, kun lupasi tolla mun omani. Oi emma. Oi emma, oi emma, kuin lupasi tolla mun omani. Now that recording is quite a contrast to the Kura Ara recording. At first, I thought it showed a difference between a Finnish and a Finnish American approach, but the American recording followed the style of dance orchestras of the time, including the renowned Dalape Orchestra of Finland, which had just such a virtuoso xylophonist named Eino Katajavori, brother of the famous kandala player Ulla Katajavori. Antti Kosola made two tours to Finland in 1928 and 1930. One of those tours, and I, I think it's the 1928 tour, had a larger group of Finnish American musicians on the Lancastria, a British cruise ship that was sunk in the early months of the Second World War and uh, was the largest number of casualties on a, on a ship that was sunk during the war. Go look it up, it's pr pretty interesting. Kosola composed a Lancastria waltz in honor of the journey, which was recorded in 1930. So let's listen to Antti Kosola's original composition, the Lancastria waltz. And, and uh, again, what you'll hear is accordion, trumpet, and xylophone, as well as saxophone and an outstanding guitar player. And the second part of this sounds to me very Finnish when it modulates to D minor. In conclusion, the early Finnish American dance musicians who recorded and toured were top notch performers capable of playing a wide variety of music in a multitude of settings. Many were musician union members and earned at least part of their livelihoods from music. The archival evidence shows that they could read and write music well, which meant that they studied music, most likely in private studios, which were very prolific at the time. 
there was a strong two-way connection between Finnish and Finnish American dance music through tours, sharing of sheet music, and sound recordings. These musicians served as role models and sources of music for many of the local Finn Hall musicians. But this is only the first part of the story. Their legacy may be heard in more recent Finnish American bands, such as the Third Generation, the Olu Hotshots, American Poyat, the Northwest Delimannit, Finn Hall, Finn Folk, Oivan Ilo, and many other individuals and groups. I hope this music lives on well into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, we've had some really wonderful um, questions and comments coming through the chat. Um, and I did want to um, uh, bring up one or two. Um, okay. uh, so the first is um, a question about um, the term Belkayu and um, uh, whether that means a, uh, or a night when one does not sleep or stay up the whole night, um, maybe to dance or uh, other romantic activities would be taking place. Um, Which term is it now? It's Valkia Yo. Valkia Uet. Valkia Uet means okay. white <laughs> nights, white nights. And, it, and what it refers to is midsummer because it never gets dark. I mean, if you lived in Finland, three months, you don't see stars. I'm serious, you don't. It never gets dark enough for that. So uh, it's like like the the Russian song, too, of White Nights. That's what it means. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, and yes, they do stay up late at dance. <laughs> <laughs> dance around the bonfire. They build bonfires at, uh, at uh, midsummer. It's a, it's a tradition, a marvelous thing, I think, to do that. Right, thank you for that. Um, and then someone else um, brought up Frankie Yankovic's name, and um, and he was a Slovenian accordion player. Yeah, I know, I know about Frankie. I do yeah. because uh, before I started doing, uh, really strangely, this is a weird story, but it's true. I started doing research with polka bands in Western Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, like Eddie and the Slovenes, yeah, and Jerry Intahar Ensemble. <laughs> And, and uh, Frankie Yankovic would tour here, but what he would do, and it was kind of unique, was that he came just by himself with his accordion and he used the local musicians in Johnstown and other places to play with him. So when I would interview these, these uh, um, fantastic uh, dance musicians who are here, I, I hesitate to call them polka musicians because when I, when I did that, they were a little bit insulted. They say, we're more of a variety band. We can play all kinds of music. And they really, really could. They all very proudly said, I got to play with Frankie Yankovic. <laughs> and Frankie's a really good player and so on. And, uh, and he became kind of the, the most, most famous one in the polka craze. I, I, I imagine he might have been a virtuoso musician. You know, when I say a virtuoso, I don't say that lightly. The old turpin, and you, you could get maybe a thousand accordion players who are extremely good, but she was like the best. And in my own field work, I've only seen maybe one or two that can play at that level, at the level that she could play. Um, would he have had was would his playing have had much of an influence or crossover at all with Finnish American dance music, or did you see people? Have you noticed evidence of um, of uh, sort of inter-ethnic collections and enjoyment of different um, mixing different ethnic music well, um, tunes within? Oh uh, yes, uh, yes, American absolutely. Band. When I when I finally I did that that polka band work and I thought it was so interesting. I mean, you know, as a folklorist, you're like in pig heaven in Western Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's just the best thing. Uh, the paper that I presented or the paper that I wrote for that research was called Pan-Ethnic Polkas in Pennsylvania. And what I found were that the Slovenian bands, uh, well, the Slovenian band like Jerry Intar Ensemble, he had a, 
a Polish drummer who would sing half the tunes in Polish because they knew their audiences. Now, I just uh, know that Michael Lokinen did this film and he, he was recording Oren Tikkanen, who is like Mr. Finnish American music in the Upper Peninsula, but he plays a lot of different styles of music. He'll do some Slovenian polkas in there and so on. And being a musician myself, the thing about it is that, that uh, we don't live in a glass bubble. If we like something, we're gonna be playing it. You know, and that's that's just the way it is. And yes, there's going to be mixing like that. And and you know, if you have a so-called Finnish dance, and you have a few Italians and a few uh, Slovenes and a few other folks that come to that, they're perfectly welcome to come. And uh, and I'd, well, see that 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 research actually was never published until. Uh, it, it, the entire thing was published as an introduction to European American uh, music in the Garland Encyclopedia of World Music, USA volume. And so all of that polka stuff is in there. And, and I said something to the effect that, that uh, music and dance and food are the things that, that uh, go between ethnicities. We can appreciate those things between ethnicities. And uh, that, that's really true. Carl, we had quite a few questions come through the Q&A box. I thought maybe I'd ask a couple of those of you. Sure, well. absolutely. The first one is multi, multi-part question from Karen. And I, I think this came at about the time that you had up on the slideshow a lot of the different uh, genres from the Davis collection in Minnesota. Oh, yeah. And she said, okay. which regions of Finland did these specific dances originate from? And were there more sources beyond Poyanma and Ostrobothnia and what happened to the music from other regions of Finland? Were those also mixed in with ones from Poyama or are they from separate sources? Well, Lionel Davis, I, I, uh, in the chapter, I say a little bit about his background. He, he uh, Lionel Davis was, was a Jewish guy who took an ethnomusicology class. And he had played uh, with the piano with a, a Finnish accordion band up in Thunder Bay and really got into that music. So he wrote, it's not a master's thesis, it's, it's like a term paper for a class for Dr. Alan Kagan, who I happen to know as well at the University of Minnesota. He's long, long retired. Kagan's a, a brilliant man as well. And what, and I have to go by with what Davis says in that. He would say that these are, are song pieces. In other words, they're sung pieces, and they're coming mostly from Eastern Finland not from Ostrobothnian region, at least the, the things that are found in the Davis collection. Now, to trace that down, uh, Antti Pollen, he's, he's a guy who I had to find out as much as I possibly could because he's figures most prominently in the workers' music chapter, because when you had a socialist hall, or let's say a communist hall, they wanted to invent a new type of music, a new genre of music, which was for the proletariat, okay? So they hired composers to actually compose music. Antti Pollen was one of those composers. Now, if indeed, and, I, and there's no way to know for sure that Antti Pollen made these transcriptions, then this is the dance side of what they played in those halls. And so you're going to find uh, like uh, Karelian pieces in there, other pieces, because, because uh, at some point, the, the communist Finns, at least 6,000 of them, took off and went back to Karelia. So they had a connection there with that type of music. So the Davis collection is not, uh, doesn't speak so much to the Ostrobothnian uh, tradition and more towards Eastern Finland. At least that's what um, Lionel Davis says in his term paper. Okay. We have a, another, the next, thank you for that response. We have another question uh, from Norm and Dolly Ford, who note that in their own collections, they came across quite a few Colombian Victor finished recordings. And the question that they ask is, yeah, great. That's wonderful stuff. I love it. <laughs> uh, they, the question is, was it financially, uh, Mo was it financially motivated that these companies were recording ethnic music? Uh, or do you think maybe it was some sort of uh, greater 
this this is my own addition to it was it some sort of greater purpose to record the ethnic musics of america or uh, was it strictly a financial decision to market this music and well, uh, someone like Becca Grono or the, uh, many of the other record collectors, I, I want to throw a name out there, George Kipper. I don't know if you've heard of George. He's retired from the Library of Congress. He's an avid uh, collector of Finnish American 78s. He's, he's half Finnish, half Estonian, and he has a, a personal collection that is just sine qua non. Now, the thing about it is that they did not record to make money, pop, period. Uh, if you look into it, they got paid a flat fee per side. And when Viola Turpin and John Rosenthal recorded their first earliest discs for Columbia, they got paid 35 bucks for each tune, and they lost all rights to it. They got no royalties. Do you understand how that worked? So if you go into the studio and you record, you know, and then for Victor, and I think, and they switched to Victor, and Becca Grono writes, and, and maybe the best. Uh, narrative about Viola Turpin and are on those four CD reissues that came out in, in 1990s with Toivo Tamminen and with Becca Grono, who wrote the liner notes. And they, they really did uh, fantastic research. And, and they switched from Columbia to Victor Company. And, and Becca writes, and I, and, and I agree with, with Becca, that uh, they got paid 50 bucks a side. They got paid a little more, you know, at Victor. My personal theory is that they switched to Victor because Viola was studying with Pietro Dero and Victor was the company that Dero recorded with. You see what I'm saying? And so they had had a, an in there to be able to go and do that. So the recordings were kind of like we made a recording and and uh, they could sell them on their tours. But uh, I know that John and, and Viola sold more sheet music of some of the pieces, the original compositions that they did on tour. And uh, the recording was that. And then recording, and the, and the ethnic market was a big market before the Great Depression. But after the Great Depression, nobody's recording ethnic music. It became a specialty market. In fact, the later Viola Turpin and recordings, the ones that, that were done, and there was no recording at all during the Second World War because of the war and because of lack of supply. So the, the later 1930s recordings were really unusual because uh, there was still a demand for her music. In the 1950s, she recorded uh, on a label called the Standard or it was a specialty label, mm -hmm. you see. And so, so uh, Victor and Columbia got out of those. Now, the best discography is the Richard Spotswood discography of ethnic recordings. That that is a I have it sitting here at my elbow to look up and find out who they were, and uh, and I have relied upon that. Now the thing is this is that I can tell you for a fact that the people who recorded were your top-notch musicians, and they I don't know if they're representative of the many many amateur musicians who were playing in fin halls because i'm sure every fin hall had a group of musicians local musicians who played and what tunes did they play well the ones that were recorded and the ones that they knew from yala Seattle, for example does that make sense yeah absolutely uh, a lot of the proliferation of custom recordings didn't really come about until the 1950s or so yeah um, well i uh, there was a follow-up based on Viola Turpin, and Lars was wondering if there are some video recordings of Viola that he could watch her play. No, there are no video recordings, but uh, but my friend Kipper at the Library of Congress, one of his things was he was cataloging radio transcriptions, and Viola Turpin made a, an appearance on the on that Bowles Amateur Hour radio program. Here's this highly prolific professional. <laughs> who it, no one knows really, except outside of the Finnish community, right? And she goes on and, and plays these sorts of things. And that radio transcription is one of the last things that's found on those, uh, the reissues of the CDs, because uh, I think Kipper just ran across it and was, was shocked. Yeah, I don't know of any video of her. Now the photographs, there's lots and lots of prolific photographs of of Viola Turpin, John Rosenthal, uh, Sylvia Polso, that, that entire group. 
and and the ones when they went on tour to Finland because they took pictures on the ship. A lot of those pictures, like that Lancaster picture that I showed, they took pictures on the ship. Almost all of those photographs, the originals, are found at the Sirtolaisuus um, Institute, the the uh, Migration Institute in Turku in Finland because they were collected by Toivo Tamminen and they're in Tamminen's collection. And Tamminen has been putting all of these examples up on YouTube under the name Dalape 30, like the Dalape Orchestra, and, and then some. And he put a lot of photographs up there as well. Now, the thing is that uh, in a face-to-face, -face, and this is a face-to-face -face thing, I can, uh, as far as copyright laws, I can show you a short excerpt and so on. But I can point you to those resources, which are, are licensed on YouTube, and you can go listen to them. And let me tell you, it was extremely enjoyable. And I, I didn't want to just give you information, information. I wanted people to hear it because this is not a lecture. This is a music presentation. And I, and I did play some of the pieces because I did at the beginning, which were pre-recorded, but uh, the other wonderful music presentations, Diane uh, Yatterby and uh, Eric Peltoniemi, they, they performed live, which was absolutely stunning to me to hear those musicians. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm very much enjoying this musical presentation. We've gotten some wonderful comments. Also, several more questions, if you're okay answering. A few I'm more good. More. Uh, we have a question from Dan who wonders if in, in, in your research, did you come across the name Paula Celine, who was an accordion player who toured the Midwest and played on ships to Finland? She was my grandfather's niece, says Dan. No, I haven't seen that name. And actually, I didn't even do all of the names of people that have recorded that have been documented. But, uh, well, let me, let me tell you where the documentation is. Uh, Simo Westerholm uh, was a uh, researcher, uh, folklorist, ethnomusicologist at the Gonsan Musikin Institute in Kaustinen. And uh, he, he became really interested in this Finnish American stuff. And they made two field trips to the US. And then uh, Toivo Tamminen, who is, is, is uh, <laughs> One of the best researchers I've known, but he's he's not trained to be a researcher. He does, does this because he's interested. He wrote up detailed things, typed them out, and sent them to Simo in at the Folk Music Institute in Kaustinen. So I went to Kaustinen, and I was only able to spend three days there. But there's more information there specifically. But of course, you have to read Finnish fairly well. They were planning a book called uh, Finnish Music in America. And that book never came out, but it would be wonderful to do that kind of a book, even if it's in Finnish. And of course, uh, I, I've been pulling information out of that, which has been collected by Toivo Tambin and, and Simo Westerholm. I'm, and just looking at the correspondence, all of this from the 1990s. So it's... Uh, you know, 20, 25 years old. And I did not see that name, but let me tell you, there are there's probably 150 different musicians that are documented in that, that collection. So I'm, I'm not gonna say that it's not there, but uh, I haven't heard. And again, what are the three sources? The stuff you find in archives, people who recorded and newspaper accounts. Those newspaper accounts are so, so important, right? Uh, the Raivaya newspaper, Yes, at the end, the Finnish American Reporter. Those those are really your best sources to be able to find find them information. Or if the family member has things, you know, I would say to this this person, do you have anything left over from this relative who performed? And make sure it gets into an archive. You know that uh, I'll give you a good example. John Rosenthal kept maybe five diaries. There's only one of them, and that was the one that, that Viola Turpinen kept and went to Bill Suryala's collection, and it's at the Finnish American Historical Archives in Hancock. That's that first one that has the cover that I showed. The other four diaries are photocopies that were done by Toivo Tamminen because those diaries were in possession of a man named Norman Birch, who was John Rosenthal's nephew. 
okay? And I'm so happy that Toivo Tamminen photocopied those and then they made PDFs of them. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't have had anything to study this year, except yeah. what other people had written. Do you see what I'm saying? And so, so it's important that 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 the the original source material be preserved, because the uh, when writing the history, you need to have something something that shows that. Absolutely, uh, we have another question. I appreciate the shout out to music libraries and archives as well. Yes, as we are tied uh, up. In what them. you guys are doing in Wisconsin, you you don't know. A hundred years from now, it could be the most important thing to document the upper Midwest um, music culture. I'm, I'm very serious about that. We're certainly trying. Thank you. Uh, Katrina Mackey asks, uh, I would be interested to know, uh, to hear more about what you would, uh, I should just read it rather than summarize. I would be interested in hearing what you have to say about Kerensky, having learned the tune from Rich Kosky recently. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I worked as a music librarian, so I get this uh, um, reference question that came by email, and I forget who sent it to me, but they said, I want to know about Kerensky. Well, you know who Kerensky was. He was the interim governor of Russia before the Bolshevik revolution. I mean, after the Tsar was deposed, there was this guy in there, Kerensky. And what they did was they made a song in Finnish about Kerensky. And the, and the lyrics say something like, Kerensky was baking bread, and he used these various countries as in, ingredients in the bread, right? And, uh, and it was a pejorative thing against the uh, Russian rule. And of course, Finland was not independent at the time when they were doing that. They set it to a tune called Karapiet. Karapiet, it's a Russian tune, okay? If you'll go out and listen to the Russian dance, it's a great tune. <laughs> and, but it's like other Russian tunes, you know, it's a nice, nice polka. So that's what I can tell you about the, the um, song Kerensky. Now, if you go out on YouTube and you look at Kerensky, you can see the various uh, versions of it with the good English translations of the, of the song itself and lots of, lots of dancers dancing to it. And if you look up Karapiet, you'll see that there are many Russian versions of that particular tune. Great. Uh, and it's worth noting again, I think, uh, Anna may have mentioned in the comments, but we do have a full list of, of, of Carl's links to all of these various tunes and everything. And those will be, of course, posted um, in time, as will this presentation on YouTube. And we'll have all of this. Uh, let me say too that uh, I'm very easily located. That's carl.rachkonen at gmail.com. If anyone wants to carry on a conversation, I, I've had the most brilliant conversations with people from different things. And I always learn a lot of really cool things from, from folks. So if you want to contact me, please feel free to do so. Let's drop that in the chat again right now. I'll type it over there. That's Carl. Dot. Uh, R A H K O N E N. There's a dot between there? Yeah, there's a dot between. Okay. At Gmail. At gmail.com. All right. You are in the chat. Um, there's another question here from Norm Ford who says amongst his collection of Finnish American 78s, he noticed that several are labeled as comic songs. Is this unusual for Finns, he asks? Absolutely not. I mean, it's just so, so uh, typical. What I've learned when I've looked at these things really closely, uh, take someone like Antti Kosola. Kosola was born in um, Wisconsin and he, mm -hmm. uh, accompanied people who came to the U.S. from Finland and toured around. Like, for example, there was a comic scene, singer named Tatu Pekkarinen. <laughs> and I've had to find out about Tatu Pekkarinen and, and uh, several other ones who had come. And they used, of course, they didn't bring an accordionist with them. And if they didn't play accordion or piano, they needed to have someone that could do that. And and the story that I had read just recently was that that Kosola put together that Fifth Avenue uh, dance orchestra that had Bill Suriela, it had Viola Turpin and Sylvia Polso and Kosola. 
But Kosolo was given a chance to tour with Pekkarinen for a year. So he goes off and he's touring around the various pin halls. When, when Kosolo gets back, he finds out that the other musicians have formed their own group and he's been kicked out. <laughs> and, that is uh, the risk. Yeah, and so that's the risk. And we know as musicians, we know as musicians that we, we recreate bands all the time. Now, the comic singers, the comic singers was a, a big deal. Ye Alfred Tunner and, and so on, the, the comic songs were, were a very, very important part. And they, they called them couplette or couplet singers. These are comic songs that were put together in couplet format to uh, do that. And, uh, and there's just too many of them to even talk about that. Let's see, I just saw one here from Oren Tikkanen about Ernest Bonanen. Uh, Oren, uh, that, that last photograph I showed, the only musician besides Ante Kosova that I recognized on there was Ernest Bonanen in the very middle. In fact, um, there's a part here I cut out that I need to make sure I've got it correct here. Okay, okay. This is for, for my friend Oren Tikkanen, and everybody else can benefit too. There was a program that was found among William Suriela's papers, and uh, I think this is going to be there in Hancock, right? From onboard ship, it was a program showed a 10-member orchestra who was playing Andrew Kosola as the pianist. The bandmaster was Oscar Tofferi. Tofferi was... Uh, a choir director, band director, and a cantile player. And his brother, Eino, Eino, became one of the famous cantile players in Finland, Eino Tulikari. So that's Oskar Tofferi. Soprano, Aino Sari. Violinist, Ernest Pananen. Now that photograph I showed from the Lancastria, Ernest Pananen is right in the middle of that photograph. He was a violinist who played with the Cleveland Orchestra. I don't think he was concertmaster of the Cleveland Orchestra, but he, he was an awesome good violinist. And then Bill Hosurgela, who played violin and cornet. And so those were the only musicians listed. They did a short concert program followed by a dance only for first class passengers. Now, when I found that, what that shows is that there's a high level of musical training. And the fact is this, the musicians knew and performed with one another. They knew and performed with one another. And that, that is a lot. And I think that we could say the same thing with uh, musicians today. I've, I've played with Oren Tikkanen, who's one of the greatest. And if we didn't live a thousand miles apart, we'd be playing every weekend. <laughs> we just would. And, and, I, and I play with my local musicians here. And we are going to have connections. There is another photograph that I showed. And it showed the two Mackey siblings. It showed uh, Arvo and Signe. Arvo, uh, he has... Uh, his piano accordion, Signa has her, her saxophone. Then there's another piano accordionist standing there with me. Do you know who that piano accordionist was? That was Sylvia Polso. Viola Turpinen uh, grew up in Iron River, which is like 10 miles away from Caspian, where the Mackey Trio was. Do you think they knew each other? Yes, they did. Were they friendly with one another? Yes, they were. <laughs> Just like we know other people in other bands. And if we need a bass player for this gig, we know where to find one and that sort of thing. I hope that that answers that question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we might have time for one one last question. There's a, it looks like there's a uh, one here from Jim Leary, uh, who's tuning in. And he wants to know about, regarding Kerensky, do you know about a special dance that might go with this tune? Uh, he's, heard, he's heard people in the upper Midwest mention that Kerensky, like Ratiko, uh, requires distinct steps. Uh, yes. Which is a good way uh, to kind of draw together the dance and the music. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, uh, I think that the Kerensky dance, it, I think it might be some of those Russian steps that were done to Karapiet. <laughs> That's my theory about it, at least. But I don't, I, I haven't seen it. Well, go on and uh, YouTube has quite a few different examples from Finland of that piece being performed and sung and danced. So Great. I think that that could be, uh, that could be accurate. There was a special dance. Now the whole thing generally, as far as dance, 
is that it's, it's, it's kind of sad that there are fewer and fewer Finnish Americans who know how to do the dances. Just, just fewer. I, my, my hat's off to people like Kay Sepfella, who has a dance troupe where she's teaching young people to do some of these dances. And they do this as, as an exhibition. And the same thing with that, there's a, a Scandinavian dance group in, in Pittsburgh that they do these, these performances where they show how to do the dances. But in the old days, when these people were touring, everyone knew how to do the dances. And now who knows how to do a Yenka really properly and who, but, but waltzes, polkas, those are more um, inter-ethnic, if you will, you know what I'm saying? So uh, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter, you know how to do the waltz, you know how to do the polka, but, but shoddish is far less, far fewer people know how to do that. Now there has always been uh, like Polskas, there are people who are totally nutso about this, and they're they're going to get together and have have these things, but it's not out there in a general population that can do it. Well, you're working on a book right now about Finnish dance music. Perhaps you could put some footstep directions in with the little drawings <laughs> about how to do each dance. Would be pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the book the book is coming along. I have several chapters done, but uh, and I when I read it back, I said it's it reads like it's been written by a music librarian. So I don't think which it's is gonna, great. <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, uh, <laughs> the thing is that that I'm having fun in retirement, and it, it it is extremely, extremely interesting. And I've fallen down so many rabbit holes you can't imagine, but they're all interesting ones, and good ones. And uh, and I think that I'm going to have something that I'm just will put on the web, and people can can use it. At least it will be very well documented. <laughs> And it is well, worth pointing people to the Finnish American Reporter again as well, because you just had something out about Finnish dance music in that. That, that was basically the text of uh, that I had to leave out, you know, the, the biographies of people. Great. Anna, do you have uh, another? I was just, just, just going to say that I just put a link in the chat for the Finnish American Reporter, which is where uh, people can find that that most recent piece that you published, Carl, and, and uh, it's not in a digital format, but people can find, um, find out how to subscribe there. And perhaps at your local library, you've got um, access to that uh, publication. But. Yeah, what, what I found from doing this whole exercise is it doesn't really matter where you publish it, but if you publish it, someone will find it like 30 years down the road and they'll say, oh, that's the greatest article on that, <laughs> and you can find it. And as a librarian, we're we're going much more digital, so we're we're able to find that needle in the haystack that that's made out of solid gold. You know what I'm saying? So that that's why uh, people say, why do you publish in the Finnish American Reporter? Well, because it it is um, uh, something that has to do with Finnish America. Very important. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you. I think it's probably time that we uh, press end on the record button, but this has been a wonderful, wonderful presentation on behalf of Nordic Folklife Crew and on FinFest USA. Uh, thank you for joining us and sharing all of your research and experience and uh, good music with us. Thank you. And I, I appreciate your doing such a nice job with this for the whole year. That's fantastic. It's been an awesome year and there's more to come next year. We're very excited to continue our partnership with FinFest. So it'll be thank great. you, Carl. And thank you, Anna, for your wonderful uh, texts and support and getting this whole thing put together. It's only my pleasure. Um, yeah, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. We're really appreciative that you took time out of your day to, to be here and, uh, and best, uh, all the best to you in the new year. <laughs>